potential developer, uh, as, as well as some potential developments uh, that have happened in the manner of our HIV testing. Uh, for those who are still logging on to the Mentimeter, uh, this is the way to get access to it. And then we'll go back to it for this very, very important question of which team deserve to win Euro 2020 based on overall performance. And we've got seven responses thus far. So I'm going to show results or close voting and show results. Yeah, show results. Here we go. Okay, so a, a fairly, I mean, I'm not sure who's voted for France because they didn't deserve to win anything, but uh, a, fair, a, fair, a couple of honest people saying Italy were the best team. Anyway, that's just to give people a bit of time to kind of warm up on the old Mentimeter. So uh, from now, we'll get back to the presentation. I'm it, looking to do it. Uh, oh, take your camera on. Do you want to take a camera on so we can see you as you speak? Because that does help with the recording. Oh, apologies. Uh, sorry, I thought I, I forgot my camera's off. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to try and highlight a case. So this was a, uh, a case that kind of explains some of the complexities related to kind of HIV and HIV testing. Uh, so this was a 30-year-old uh, female who presented in March to St. Mary's A&E with a week's history of abdominal pain. Uh, it got acutely worse, um, so which brought her into hospital. Um, she initially reported no past medical history at all, but from being, she was from Thailand and, and spoke some but quite limited English. Uh, and she was subsequently, subsequently determined that she was um, born male, but self-identified as a female, so was transgender female. Uh, and had um, bilateral breast implants many years ago, did admit to using crystal meth, but denied any other sort of narcotics, particularly um, injected drugs. Uh, and at this point, based on that quite limited history, what are people kind of thinking? We've got a patient with um, abdominal pain, acutely worse than that past medical history. What kind of tests would we be thinking of doing for this patient? So if we go back to the Mentimeter and I can go right, and I'm hiding the results. So people can just do the, the typing up what the kind of thing, what certain tests they want to do for this patient. And I'll look and hopefully in the bottom right, we'll see some responses. Yeah, give us a minute, because it takes a little while to, to type all the text, okay? So everyone, if you've not joined, you can see the menti code at the top there. So it's, it's given us three choices. Do you want to type one thing or three things, James? I'm, I'm happy with one, to be honest. I'd, I'd be happy with anything. <laughs> All right, we're getting some responses. So um, I'll show the kind of evolving cloud. Okay, okay. So yeah, that's that's all good. So people are kind of wanting to do some imaging. There's concerns about pancreatitis, pectic ulcer disease, gastroenteritis. I have to say, I was hoping BBV screen or bloodborne virus screen would be a bit bigger uh, on the um, on the whole thing, but that um, but those are kind of all very reasonable things to consider. So going back to it, uh, so the emergency department's plan was that this was likely an intra-abdominal pathology and so they did the standard tests um, and started on keproxene and metronidazole, which is a reasonable choice, uh, arranged the CT abdomen pelvis and got the surgical team to review. Uh, the initial results came back uh, showing some hyponatremia uh, and a raised CRP uh, uh, and also quite a low albumin suggesting that there was something going on with a bit of microcytic anemia but not grossly abnormal alarming bloods. Amylase was fairly normal, suggesting that uh, pancreatitis wasn't the kind of, uh, was unlikely to be the cause at this point, but of course not completely excluding it. Um, CT abdomen pelvis was um, tricky to interpret because the patient was very slim, uh, but did suggest some, did show some ascites and some colitis. And the surgical team uh, subsequently came to see and managed to get a, dish, a bit of additional history from the patient, which that she admitted to working as an escort and had been off work effectively for a week with these symptoms. Um, they wanted to admit her to the surgical assessment unit for antibiotic fluids and to do a bloodborne virus screen. During this process, the patient had a single episode of low, uh, of reduced level of consciousness. Um, the medical team were called to see her, uh, but by that time she'd actually recovered and she became very reluctant to engage with the team at that point. 
and actually uh, she took a, her cell phone discharge soon afterwards. Uh, there was some suggestion that, there may be, that she may have been coerced into it by a friend or perhaps even a pimp at the time, and safeguarding concerns were raised, but um, what, the, that was the end of that, of that admission, how things were addressed at that time. In May, the patient re uh, returned, uh, and this time via ambulance, uh, and this was the kind of pre-arrival form from uh, LAS. Uh, she was specifically requesting a HIV test at that, uh, that time because of recent uh, promiscuous sexual activity. Uh, and on arrival, she, the history was taken by a friend translating for her, and she gave a much longer history of abdominal pain uh, with pain and defecating with occasional red blood and this two-week history of acute deterioration. Uh, at the time, she was presenting under a different name and had a different hospital number, and again, reported no past medical history to the team. Uh, on examination, the main things were some abdominal pain and her blood pressure was a little low. A parental exam was done, which was unremarkable. Uh, and she had a drugs of abuse screen at that time, which was positive for amphetamine. Her blood tests came back. Uh, two sets were done because a lot of the first results were hemolyzed. Um, and these showed these results. And essentially the kind of the ones that are blaring the abnormal was very low hemoglobin and sodium and quite a, a albumin even lower than it was before, suggesting some degree of chronic problems or um, or oral intake. The RB was a bit high, white cell count was, uh, was fairly normal. ECG at the time was unremarkable, normal uh, PR interval, normal QTC. Um, so the impression of mine uh, with the B A &E team at this point was some sort of upper GI bleed or inflammatory bowel disease, given symptoms of low hemoglobin, uh, concerns about a chronic aspect to it because of the chronically low, or well, sorry, they didn't really like know that at the time, but the low uh, MCV. So they wanted to do some more bloods and uh, to do a group and save and get some clotting, get some fluids, get, uh, get a chest x-ray and an abdominal x-ray and get the medical team involved. But the chest X-ray was performed uh, and showed this bilateral focal consolidation uh, worse on the left. And there was also a very prominent gastric bubble, which was visible on the abdominal X-ray, uh, which had this distended, descending and transverse colon and quite a lot of fecal loading. There was nothing to suggest a perforation on the chest X-ray or abdominal X-ray. And for the eagle-eyed among you, there was this rather odd collection of radiopaic, almost pellets, in the cecum that we couldn't, uh, that uh, radiologists identified, but couldn't, uh, sorry, were, were noticed, but were unable to identify, unable to tell us what they were based purely on the imaging. Uh, the patient was seen by the medical team at about um, half past midnight, where she was unwell, a bit tachypneic, uh, heart rate's quite, um, low to normal, but the blood pressure dropped quite a bit. Uh, she was a little, she was, only opening her eyes to voice, and it was difficult to ascertain her le full level of consciousness because of the language barrier. Uh, and there was uh, concerns that she was in pain on palpation of the tummy. So the impression was still that this was um, inflammatory bowel disease versus colitis. And they were reassured that the um, venous blood gas showed a static hemoglobin of just under 17. But they wanted to get some blood into her. Uh, they wanted to give her a, get an, a, a CT scan. The a &E registrar did a bedside B scan, which showed a small peridotal occlusion, but nothing else. Uh, and they wanted these additional tests and started uh, empiric intra-abdominal antibiotics again, which is all very reasonable. Uh, around 3.30, the medical team were asked to see the patient again because her blood pressure had dropped despite the fluid uh, resuscitation. And their impression was that she was septic and they wanted to, do, uh, to chase the tests, give further fluids and get ITU involved. Uh, and again, for the eagle-eyed among you, that is a genuine, that was a genuine 30 degrees Celsius, a temperature which had been 36.6 on arrival, and dropped to 30 degrees in about, um, well, over the course of about eight to nine hours. At the same time, the heart rate and systolic blood pressure dropped as well, as had her GCS. So at this point, we're wondering what could be going on for this patient? What do we think could be causing this rapid deterioration, this rapid loss of, um, temperature is going down six degrees in about nine hours. Uh, so I think we can go to the mentimeter again. Uh, find the results. So if people could fill in what they think is going on at this point. Okay. 
I'll let, I'll let a few responses come up so I don't suddenly show the one person's impression. All right. Okay, so yes, interesting. So a lot of people are kind of concerned about sepsis, which is certainly reasonable, but also a few people are mentioning about um, opiate poisoning and drugs on overdose, and that's certainly something which, um, particularly in retrospect, may be involved. So moving back to the presentation. So sepsis, certainly a possibility. Uh, acutely unwell patient who was pretty unwell before, who has just come back into hospital. Um, we certainly need to consider sepsis. It's really rapid for a patient to go from essentially normal temperature to really quite strikingly low temperature in a, fair, in a fairly warm, normal A&E department. And she's bradycardic as well, which is a little atypical. In terms of toxicity, yes, we've given the patient quite a few liters of fluid because of her low blood pressure. Um, and she hasn't, at the time, we didn't have an allergy history or anything like that on her, but we hadn't been giving her any opiates and she wasn't um, uh, requiring oxygen or anything like that, suggests this was overload. Uh, there was a possibility that she'd taken something, either um, a deliberate overdose or a kind of had taken a tablet without telling us, um, although that behavior hadn't been witnessed by anyone on the team. Uh, but then there's also the, these kind of these objects that we saw in the abdomen. Um, could they be some sort of kind of narcotic wrapped in something which is now leaking into our system and causing these problems? So if we are thinking about the kind of overdose type process, then we want to be thinking about the toxidrome, which is essentially a syndrome of toxins, how we, uh, in, and, and it's essentially divided up by this algorithm, which I have to admit was taken from Wikipedia. But essentially in this patient, she's got normal um, pupils, she's hypothermic, her bowel sounds were hypoactive, which um, I'm not sure if you can see this from the screen, but would go would be compatible with a uh, with an overdose of some or um, a reaction to sedatives. And here are some examples of sedatives. Um, but the probably the, the one that would be most relevant to this is kind of GHB. Now, GHB does cause hypotension, bradycardia, and hypothermia and um, low GCS, although. And a few kind of GHB overdoses I've seen, they tend to be a lot sicker than this patient was before she came in, and it tends to happen quite rapidly. It's also worth pointing out that GHB isn't a um, is taken as a liquid and isn't something that would be wrapped in foil or something and swallowed like that. Um, and also, the patient's uh, drugs of abuse was positive for amphetamines, although she did admit to the history of um, smoking or sorry, ingesting crystal meth. Uh, so at 5.30, the patient was re-reviewed with repeat results, which essentially um, showed some other problems as well, particularly uh, persistence of hyponatremia, but also this quite significantly low um, T4, which was uh, quite surprising. And at that point, she'd also had a CT scans, including a CT of the brain, which is unremarkable, but there were numerous abnormalities and not other CTs. So working from the top down, she had the bilateral breast implants, which we've known about, the mild uh, pericardial effusion, which was also uh, we were aware of, but she also had these multiple splenic lesions, uh, the distended gastro, uh, the distended colon, and there were also quite a lot of lymphadenopathy, which was uh, newly discovered on these scans, including some necrotic lymph nodes. And then looking back at the chest X-ray with the benefit of the CT chest, we can see an awful lot of these kind of funny lesions in the chest, like tiny little flecks. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but they're kind of just, they're on both sides. They're quite, they're bigger than you would expect for um, a standard CT. And if I was to use a, a adjective to describe them, or a pronoun actually, if I was describing them, it would be as milliseeds, which when you look back with the eye of faith at the chest X-ray with this information, you can see there are all these kind of small little lesions visible uh, throughout both lungs in keeping with minutes and keeping with miliary TB. Uh, and just uh, a word to the wise, be aware that your autocorrect will switch miliary to military with alarming persistency. Um, and then there was subsequently a second addendum to the CT report, which essentially identified a localized sigmoid perforation on the scan uh, and also identified the objects uh, which were previously 
seen on the, uh, probably more easily seen, in fact, on the abdominal x-ray. Again, even with three-dimensional imaging, there was nothing about the objects that, that was um, obvious, seemed very likely to be something that she'd ingested and that had potentially become stuck in her cecum. So at this point, there's quite a lot going on for this patient. So what are people um, thinking about right now? What would be, what do you think is a, a unifying diagnosis? What would be your kind of basic management plan at this time? Just give us a minute. Just give us a minute to write some things. Yeah, yeah that's quite right. I, I, I was just a. It's, it's the joy of giving a presentation to a computer monitor. I'm not quite sure if people are actually there or not. Yeah, we're all here. All right. So we've got four responses thus far. Five. Okay. I'll start showing results. Okay. That's good, thanks. Thank you for your responses. So we've got TB in big letters are true. We've got um, HIV and concerns about advanced HIV. Uh, some of the mention of kind of bowel perforation and uh, sepsis, as well as um, mention of HIV, CMV, colitis. And I think that the point I'm trying to make here is that there's an awful lot going on with this patient. It's really not clear. There's, it's not clear if we've got one diagnosis or several happening at once. Uh, and the management plan reflected that. Essentially, to kind of to give a summary, we believe this is a late presenting HIV, uh, a patient with a late presenting HIV, uh, military TB, this localized sigma perforation, possible ingested uh, narcotics causing a toxidrome, uh, and the drugs of abuse confirm that. In fact, the patient had persistently positive uh, drugs of abuse screens for amphetamines, even though the half life of these drugs is quite short. Uh, possible complication of sepsis and hypothyroidism and concerns about overloading this quite slim, frail uh, young patient. So the plans were, were for a HIV viral load and CD4 count to go with the HIV uh, serology tests, try and get some sputum and do some TB blood cultures uh, to see if we can identify this um, likely tuberculosis. You need to consider a lumbar puncture with miliary TB because it, it's essentially TB bacteremia, which means it can spread to the brain. And if you think, suspect someone has TB meningitis, then the treatment is you, you want to start giving treatment almost immediately and consider um, steroids, really high dose dexamethasone. If you ever do think you've got someone with TB meningitis, please, please, please call the ID team for the 24 7 on call service so we can, uh, we can respond and uh, back you up if you're wanting to do that. The patient was also started on IV thyroid hormone and had a rectal thermometer inserted and was escalated to ITU for input from the surgical and infectious diseases teams. And there was an awful lot more going on behind the scenes. So I'm going to leave the case there for now, but just to kind of ask a what if is like, would this case have turned out differently if the patient had, had a HIV test in March? Um, of course, it's not possible to know that. And it's worth pointing out that the patient self-discharged uh, within, I think, 12 hours of arriving. And it takes a HIV test a good couple of days to come back, usually quickly if it has to change sites. Was it sent off? It was not. No, the, 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 the patient came through A&E, had her initial test done in A&E, was assessed by the surgical registrar who said, um, I think we should be doing a HIV test with the next set of bloods, but unfortunately self-discharged before that test was done, uh, which is really unfortunate because had it been done, then our um, HIV team here at St Mary's covering the trust they're really, they're really proactive. Uh, they will go out and seek these patients, try and track them down. Um, I want to emphasize that this isn't true of other tests. If you have a patient with a cortisol of a random cortisol of 10, it's still up to us to chase that up. But uh, the HIV team do work very hard to track these patients down. It's also why it's so important to have up to date and accurate contact information on CERNA for our patients, because it makes it much, much easier um, for the team. But Irrespective of this, should this patient have had a test at that first admission? And for that, I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Dr. Bazzi, my colleague. 
Okay, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Um, so allow me to do, reintroduce myself. So my name is Sarjan. Um, I'm uh, one of the new Clinical Leadership and Innovation Fellows um, at Imperial, and I'm also um, an F3 working in acute medicine. Um, at Charing Cross Hospital as well. Do you want to take it on your camera because it's recording? Um, so I, unfortunately, I, don't have the, I didn't Sorry. have the luxury of a computer um, in a quiet space with a camera. Um, so as, as long as this is okay and everybody can hear me and see yeah, the screen, right. is that fine? Cool. Um, so I'm going to start off by um, discussing, uh, providing a bit of context uh, with regards to HIV in London. Um, following on from the case that Dr. Norman has uh, presented. Um, so in 2017, it was estimated that there were 38,600 people um, who were living with HIV in London. Um, and to put this figure into context, this is 38% of all those um, with HIV in the United Kingdom. So more than a third of those with HIV living in the UK um, are based in London. And the prevalence of diagnosed HIV in London residents aged uh, 15 to 59 um, is at 5.7 per thousand of the population. Um, and if you look at this figure in the context of the rest of the United Kingdom, um, it's, it's much higher. So there, no area in the United Kingdom um, uh, as, as a whole uh, district um, goes above two out of a thousand per population. Um, and this graph here really illustrates that point. Um, so as you can see on the x-axis, we have various locations, um, counties and, and districts within the United Kingdom. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the uh, rate of HIV per thousand of the population. As, as you can see, London is, is much bigger than um, various other areas in England and is at least uh, three times, if not more, um, greater in terms of the number of those um, living with HIV per thousand of population, uh, both diagnosed and undiagnosed. Um, of note on this um, graph as well, we have uh, a solid blue line. And the solid blue line here represents uh, the levels of HIV per thousand of the population in which um, extended HIV testing should be introduced. And the dotted blue line um, represents a very, very, well, a very high prevalence of HIV testing. Um, and as you can see, London eclipses both of those lines. Um, following on from this, we have a, uh, a map of various boroughs um, uh, and districts um, of London. And uh, this gives an idea of sort of the, the population, uh, the HIV population density, essentially. Um, and of local importance, we have the boroughs of uh, Hammersmith and Fulham, uh, Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. Um, and uh, those, the, the population density um, of those living it with HIV in these areas um, is, is, is above five. So, um, Hammersmith and Fulham is at 7.72 per thousand, uh, Westminster uh, is at 8.12 and uh, Kensington and Chelsea is at 9.15. Uh, what I'm trying to, to get at with these, these graphs and these figures is that compared to the rest of the UK, HIV is, uh, the HIV population um, is, is um, greater. Uh, and also there's a greater density um, of those living with HIV compared to the general population um, in London. So according to the British HIV Association, um, what prevalence per thousand of the population should prompt universal HIV testing and in what standard setting? Uh, and I'm just going to see if I can switch over. Oh. Um, To this. What do you want to do? I'm just switching over to the Mentimeter. Okay, so you shared your slides. So just go share again. Yeah. Okay, and then choose a left hand top option. 
and then we can see what you can see because at the moment we can only see your slides does that make sense oh i see okay understood uh so at the top so, so click on share screen again share screen again yeah oh understood okay perfect bit of a technical issue but we've that's it. Got you got it perfect <laughs> Okay. Just give a bit of time for a few more responses. Mm -hmm. Just give us a second, because I'll download it on our yeah. Yeah, that's fine. trickling in slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. I'll wait for a few more. Okay. Yeah, there's only five enthusiasts. I got six, six. In okay, so yeah. first voting. Okay, so um, a lot of people have gone for um, well, everyone in the United Kingdom, or either um, that, or greater than two in a thousand per population. So um, the correct answer is greater than two in a thousand, which those who are um, more eagle-eyed would have noted the a solid blue line in the bar chart um, was the point in which extended HIV testing um, should be introduced. And that was at two out of um, a thousand um, per thousand of the population. Um, and then I'll move on to the next question. Um, so in what standard setting should HIV testing be conducted? Okay, we'll wait, wait for a few more. Well, there's three, there's seven all together for okay. doing this. Okay. And, uh, the, 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 there's three, three who are not that enthusiastic. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. Okay, then. In that case, the voting is closed. Um, so, the, so, this was a bit of a, a, a trick question as such, because there are actually two correct answers here. Um, so, the majority of, of, of people went with all um, ED admissions. Um, the, the two answers um, here, uh, according to the British HIV um, Association um, and BASH guidance, is that those, and I'll, I'll just go back onto the um, slideshow. Um, so the, the British Association um, for Sexual Health uh, and HIV and also the British um, HIV Association their guidelines indicate that those who live in an area where the local population, um, the, the prevalence of HIV in the local population is greater than two out of a thousand, um, all patients who are registered to a general, practice, uh, general practitioner um, and all general medical admissions should have uh, a HIV test um, as routine, which in so can I ask a quick question? So does that mean it excludes surgical admissions? Because that last patient that we talked about was surgical, would not have been screened by the current criteria. Yeah. So uh, according to that that criteria, um, surgical admissions would be um, would be missed out from if you take the the guidelines at face value. Um, but yeah. yeah, so so theoretically, all medical admissions um, to hospitals in London in in a London area should have um, a HIV test, regardless of their their presentation. Um, and so we can clearly see that the the prevalence of HIV is much higher in London. But why is HIV testing so important in general? Well, HIV um, for for a long period of time. Um, some, some may remember uh, practicing at a time where HIV, um, uh, HIV infection had a very high uh, fatality rate um, and is now considered a, a preventable cause of mor morbidity and, and mortality. Um, 
the late diagnosis of HIV has multiple health implications as well with regards to uh, morbidity and mortality um, and, and um, the uh, contraction of AIDS-defining illnesses, um, in addition to the risk of onward transmission of patients who are unaware that they have a diagnosis of HIV and are therefore actively spreading um, the, the virus. And according to NICE, um, a review that was conducted in 2016, the cost of treating HIV per year is £14,000 per case um, in an early diagnosed patient compared to those uh, £28,000 per case uh, per year when treating a late diagnosis. And the ongoing cost uh, discrepancy um, is usually due to uh, patients um, who are diagnosed late requiring um, healthcare intervention and healthcare services um, are, are doing um, a lot more often and, and usually need um, a lot more um, healthcare intervention compared to those who are, who are um, seen um, early and treated early. Um, and it's, it's of note that the, the monetary figure, so the 14,000 and the 28,000 is an average as well for the duration of their treatment. So looking at um, the audit that we have conducted um, in May this year, um, it's important to know that this audit um, is um, part of a, a large series of work that has been conducted over uh, numerous years. Um, so the starting point of our audit um, is really sort of the, the end um, of, of a lot of work that has been conducted over a long period of time. So we wanted to follow up on the work that was conducted um, on HIV testing um, before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so before COVID-19, um, HIV testing um, within Charing Cross's AMU was noted to be at 10.7%, um, and that was in August 2019. Um, during the COVID pandemic, the, the introduction of the COVID order set uh, led to a, a large increase in HIV testing um, as HIV um, testing was part of that order set. Uh, and actually, because of so many patients with COVID were presenting to the hospital or, or query COVID, um, the, the blood tests were be, being done routinely and testing uh, managed to reach a, a pinnacle of 86% in uh, May 2020 when it was um, reaudited. So what we really wanted to do was now, now that there were less patients presenting with COVID, the COVID order set may not have been in um, use as uh, routinely as it previously had been. We wanted to assess the proportion of HIV testing, uh, the present of uh, patients presenting to Charing Cross Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital in the acute medical setting following COVID uh, to see whether there had been a sustained change uh, in the, the level of HIV testing. Um, and so what we did was we took um, uh, patients who had presented to both the acute medical setting at Charing Cross Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital over a two week period um, during the start of May. Um, and we, we looked at uh, the levels of HIV testing in these patients and uh, just briefly I'll go over the demographics of these patients. So we had 535 inpatient episodes. Um, the average age of these patients uh, was 65, um, and roughly there was an equal split between males and females who presented um, during this uh, time period, as you can see on the pie chart um, uh, on the right hand screen, uh, right hand side of the screen. So, what overall proportion of patients do you think underwent HIV testing, given the, the data that I've previously uh, given to you? I'm going to load that question up. That's another Mentimeter question. Um, Give it a bit more time. 
See if we can get to five. And then if you, if you hold just your mouse over the bottom left of the screen, bottom yeah. left, you, left. Can kind of hide, you can hide the results and that, that can mean people, are, it, it doesn't give instant feedback on, on what's uh, Oh, I see. Are they not hidden currently? No, they're not. Are they not? Okay. Well, this is, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll remember that for the, for the following questions, I guess, but uh, fine. We've got six results. Um, I will reveal that anyway. Um, so, um, so as you can see here, um, quite a, a, a cynical crowd, uh, I guess, after how high uh, the levels of testing were during the COVID pandemic. Uh, but you are correct that um, the level of, of testing um, decreased um, quite extensively um, based on the, the results uh, post COVID in, in May. Um, 2021. Um, so um, of those 535 inpatient episodes, 18.32% of patients received a um, HIV test during that admission. Um, and this gives a bit of a more detailed breakdown in, in terms of um, the settings in which we investigated and, and the patients, uh, the proportion of patients who underwent HIV testing. Um, and no area um, tested above 25%. Um, I think Charing Cross's um, AMU and AAU got close to 25%, um, and St. Mary's uh, EMSS and EMA was slightly below that. Um, so looking at this proportion of patients, how many patients do you feel who were admitted to um, St. Mary's Hospital and Charing Cross Hospital during this audit period, uh, period had a um, historical HIV test? That's another question. So this is a HIV test that wasn't conducted during the two week period that we collected the data, but they had previously had a HIV test at some point. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show the results. So um, again, we went with 20, 20 to 30%. So the answer here was um, 30%. Um, so if I go back to the presentation, um roughly 31.4 percent um of those um during that two-week period at the start of may um had had a previous hiv test um which is um i guess reflects the fact that if we had 86 percent um hiv testing during covid probably reflects that those patients who um had covid um and had a HIV test during their admission are probably not representing to um, hospital, which is, um, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, so of that 31.4%, what percentage of them were within the, what percentage of patients were tested within the last six months? So from May, um, six months prior to May within that period. Um, and if I come across again, So roughly these are patients who've had a HIV test um, from December to, to May 2021. December 2020 to May Wait for a few more. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the results. Okay, a bit more of a spread on this occasion. Um, so the correct answer here is roughly um, around 45%. Um, so we can have a look at uh, this. So th these, this um, bar chart shows um, patients who had undergone uh, HIV testing uh, prior to their admission um, during our data collection period. Um, and the, the pink line shows roughly at 45% um, patients who had undergone HIV testing um, within the last six months. Um, and roughly, also roughly around sort of 40, 45% um, patients who had undergone historic testing um, between sort of a year and two years um, ago. So more than 90% of, of those who, of the 31.4% of the total sample um, had undergone um, HIV testing at least one to two years um, prior to their admission on this occasion. So the conclusions that we can draw from this, um, so 18.3% of patients across the acute medical departments in Chang Cross and St. Mary's Hospital received a HIV test in the first two weeks of May. Um, the target is at 100% uh, according to local and national guidance. Um, and uh, we were at one point at 86% uh, during COVID and now have come back down as the COVID order set um, is not being used as frequently. Um, despite HIV testing at the peak of the COVID pandemic reaching 86%, as I've said, only 31.4% of admissions had a historic HIV test, um, indicating that those patients with COVID probably haven't come back into hospital. Um, and of those who have had a historic HIV test, the majority of these tests have been taken within 24 months of their admission in May. So how can we improve HIV testing? And I'm gonna open up um, a general sort of question uh, to the, the audience. Um, just any idea, any ways that people think from what they have witnessed, uh, the information that they've gathered, um, stuff that they've learned from this presentation or from work that's been conducted over um, uh, a previous occasion. Okay, got make it part of the EDO descent. Yeah, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of suggestions regarding uh, blood order sets and and how we take bloods um, and and um, also one for behavioral science. Um, Good. Okay. So if we go back, um, so the, re the recommendations, so these, so these recommendations are, um, have been in the pipeline for, um, numerous, uh, years and the, the audit that we've conducted on this occasion, um, simply highlights, um, work that has gone on, um, over, over a, an extended period of time. Um, and have sort of reiterated the, the, the views and opinions and the um, statistics and the information of other studies that have gone prior to the ones that we've conducted uh, recently. But one of the key recommendations was the introduction of opt-out HIV testing um, in the emergency departments um, at Imperial. Um, and so it has been uh, proposed um, and a new guidance has come out um, locally um, from May 2021, um, that a HIV test is performed routinely um, in all patients who attend ED um, who are requiring venipuncture, unless patients specifically opt out. Um, and I, I think that's one of the keys is that there's a common misconception that patients uh, who um, require HIV testing require uh, lengthy pre-test discussions and, and consent um, this, this, is, this is not the case. Um, if a patient doesn't wish to have a HIV test, they're, they're not going to be forced to have a HIV test, but HIV testing should be conducted routinely on all patients um, who, are, who are having bloods taken, essentially. And so in order to try and um, reinforce this, 
um, a fourth generation HIV test will be added to all the blood order care sets within the um, emergency department. Um, and this is currently underway. Um, I, th I think there's been a bit of a delay with updating the order sets on CERNA, um, but this is something that will be coming into uh, force um, at um, the Imperial um, Trust. Um, and a CERNA repeat order note will flag up whether a HIV test has been ordered within the past three months. So if you have, if there are patients who come in on multiple occasions in a short space of time, um, these patients won't have repeated HIV uh, tests. Um, and this bit in yellow, I think, is, is very important as well, because there are many clinicians who conduct HIV, or not many clinicians, but some clinicians are, are concerned that if they conduct HIV testing and they have a positive result, what then happens to that positive result? What do they have to do and what, and what is their, their responsibility? Um, so there is actually a service that is already um, uh, in, in provision. Um, the HIV team will be notified of all reactive and positive results um, and all patients who have positive results will be contacted and offered the appropriate intervention. So a patient who has um, a blood test and they're HIV positive in ED, um, it, it, the, they, the HIV team will be notified and they will receive effective treatment and care um, according to that positive um, HIV test result. Um, so the way that other ways that we can try and promote um, opt out HIV testing um, uh, and, and HIV testing in general um, is the introduction of um, patient information leaflets, uh, posters. So there's currently uh, a leaflet that has been introduced to the trust um, from late May, um, early June um, this year, uh, which reinforces um, opt out HIV testing. Um, and that has, um, it, it's, a, it's a leaflet that gives um, information, to, lay, lay information to patients, but it's also quite useful for staff as well, who are interested in finding out more. Um, and it, it gives a basic overview of what HIV is, um, what happens if they test negative, what happens if they test positive, and that patients can also opt out of testing if they wish, but they should have a HIV test if they're having their bloods taken um, during their trip to hospital. Um, and there's, we will also try and create a, a poster which um, will essentially reinforce this information as well. So this is an extract from the leaflet that has been um, created um, and is currently in, in circulation. Um, and as, as I said earlier, it covers a bit of an introduction of what HIV is, um, test results, um, what to do if the patients don't want HIV test and what happens if um, they have a, a positive result. And this can currently um, be found on the Imperial NHS Foundation Trust homepage. Um, it, so it can be accessed um, from anywhere. Um, it's on the uh, Imperial page. Um, if you go on patients and visitors, you then click patients, then patient information and um, uh, patient information leaflets. Um, and it's under the trust wide section as HIV testing. It's um, uh, clearly set out and very easy to access. Um, this is an example of a poster that may be introduced. Um, it's, it's not in circulation currently. Um, there's currently work being conducted on, on a poster. Um, and uh, again, it just reinforces the message of universal opt out HIV testing. So the state of affairs currently. So the following clinicians, so uh, Dr. Anu Mitra, Dr. Matilda Fox, Dr. Rosie Petit, Dr. Ernest Mutangesa, and Dr. Alice Harper are all involved in uh, assessing the state of affairs with HIV testing um, in ED. Um, the current state of affairs is that we're roughly getting around 25% of 18 to 16 year olds uh, being tested for HIV. Um, as I said earlier, we're in the process of adding that HIV testing uh, to all the blood order sets uh, on CERNA um, for those who are having bloods taken in ED. Um, CERNA will provide a prompt for those who have had HIV testing within the last three months. Um, and the guidance has been changed from May this year um, in order to um, allocate or, or uh, provide a greater emphasis on opt-out uh, HIV testing. Um, so in summary, previously opt-in HIV testing has proven insufficient to meet both local and national guidance. Uh, and therefore, and uh, from the data that's been collected over 
Um, many, many years we've seen that prior to the pandemic, testing was at 10.7%. During the pandemic, when co um, HIV testing was added to the COVID blood order set, testing was much higher. Um, and then now that we've come out of um, the post, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, touch wood, um, we've, we've come out of, of um, the worst of the, the COVID pandemic, um, the COVID order set has been used much less often. And so HIV testing has um, decreased from this. Um, and so this suggests that the use of blood order sets can substantially and very, very importantly here, it, it can sustain HIV testing um, at Imperial. And I think that's that's the key is that um, any change that is made needs to be sustained. Um, and obviously, as the emergency department is usually the place where venipuncture is first conducted, um, naturally, it makes sense to change the order care sets for those um, who take bloods on, um, on CERNA in the emergency department. But this should really be done in all acute settings. Um, and the target, therefore, is to achieve, as I said earlier, very importantly, sustainable 100% um, testing in all medical admissions to hospital um, who are undergoing venipuncture. And this is in accordance with both local and national guidance. Uh, and I must give a very special mention to um, the following clinicians. Um, these clinicians um, have worked tirelessly over a, a large number of years in order to, to get to the stage that we're at right now. It's been, a, it's been a, um, a culmination of all their hard work and dedication. Um, Dr. Faye Prost, Dr. Asif Rahman, uh, Professor Francis Bowen, and Dr. Nicola Mackey, who have managed to um, really push for universal opt-out HIV testing, um, facing many, many um, challenges uh, along the way, and, and have got to this point in time. Um, and um, yeah, so kudos to them and their team for, for getting to this stage. Um, and then I think Dr. Norman, did you want to finish off? You can uh, stop sharing your screen. I'll just uh, wrap up the case very quickly. Hopefully that is done by. Yeah, uh, stop video on it. Uh, <laughs> is there a way to you share? Can share? You can just share. Um... I'll go there. Okay, okay. never mind. There yeah. we go. All right. So I share my top right screen. Share. Okay. Can everyone see now back to the case? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so just to remind us, this was a 30 year old uh, Thai and transgender female who had this acute and chronic ab uh, abdominal pain uh, and recurrent episodes of bradycardia, hypertension, hypothermia in any. There are significant abnormalities on imaging, these lesions in the cecum, distended uh, ascending colon, and midary TB visible on the chest. She also had significant hypothyroidism and her drugs and abuse screen, positive for amphetamines, and numerous other problems, including hyponatremia, which is too numerous to list here. After she was uh, escalated to the intensive care unit, she was intubated and ventilated later that day and taken to the uh, theater by the surgeons who performed a defunctioning ileostomy. And as soon as they looked inside the abdomen, they could see it was caked with, uh, with a tuberculosis in a way that's kind of almost pathognomonic of TB, but they weren't able to visualize rectal perforation or the cecum. Uh, the patient was moved to Chelsea Westminster as a, a, a newly diagnosed HIV patient. Her CD4 count was low. It wasn't catastroph catastrophically low, but it was significantly low, low enough to kind of qualify as acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And the patient resource was commenced on antiretrovirals uh, soon after she started on TB therapy. Usually when it comes to tuberculosis and HIV and AIDS, we wait until the patient's had uh, some time on TB therapy first to try and prevent uh, an immune reconstitution, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome occurring. I think in this case, the patient was so unwell that the ARVs were started a bit sooner than that, which, is, can, which can be the case. The tuberculosis was confirmed and it was from multiple sites, including the uh, abdominal samples and samples from a BAL while she was intubated. Uh, lumbar puncture done up in the intensive care unit had less than five white blood cells, which is very reassuring uh, to suggest there was no TB meningitis. During her admission over at uh, 
Chelsea and Westminster, she had multiple episodes of these high fevers and tachycardia and low blood pressure, which was believed to be due to what were probably amphetamines wrapped in foil in her cecum. And the reason they thought that is that she was persistently positive for amphetamines on her drug abuse screen for, I think, several days, if not weeks early on. Uh, there was also, the, they, they were talking about whether she needed to go to theatre to actually remove these packets. And I think ultimately they managed to give her a quite huge amount of laxatives and eventually they were dislodged and came out spontaneously. The patient also was uh, developed by ventricular failure um, and the hyponatremia was persistent. She had this problem with the thyroid, developed a thrombus in the right femoral vein and had significant other medical and surgical problems. Uh, I mean, she was in the intensive care unit for quite some time and was really very unwell on occasion. But over time, thanks to the hard work of the intensive care, surgical and HIV teams, and to a lesser extent, the ID team at St. Mary's, the patient actually was able to get onto maintenance therapy for a TB. She was able to get down to the ward and regain her independence. And she was ultimately discharged earlier this week to the care of her sister, the safeguarding issues were raised again, but the patient denied needing any kind of help and support there. And as of yesterday, she's been seen at home by one of the TV nurses who did a home visit. And it looks like everything is going according to plan since discharge. Early days yet, but hopefully if we can keep her on her ARVs and help her to complete a tuberculosis treatment, she should hopefully make a full recovery from all this. So the take home message is that uh, opt-in testing whereby we offer people the HIV test when we think of it is an unsustainable way of, main, of getting adequate HIV testing. And that's something which countless studies have shown and we've proven that as well. Uh, we prove, we've not proven, but we've shown that with, with the incorporation of the HIV test into certain kind of order care sets, we can vastly increase our level of testing. And that's something which we're beginning to roll out as part of an opt-out policy. Uh, in fact, uh, due to a great deal of work behind the scenes by Dr. Mackey and others. Uh, consent is provided by posters on the wall in phlebotomy areas. It's not something we have to go into a great deal of detail on. Uh, that's something that they do at, at Chelsea and Westminster. And there are other trusts that are even more aggressive with it. I, I may be wrong when I say if it's the Royal Free, but there's one of the other trusts which will, the virology department, if they have a sample and there's not been a HIV test for six months, which do you want spontaneously, which is taking things quite far but uh, we've got a long way to go before we get to that level. Uh, any positive results will automatically get fed back to the HIV team for follow-up, and that's not something that is required for you to chase and then call them up. If it is done on a patient who's in hospital, then please send a repeat test and speak to the HIV team. Uh, Dr. Mack is on the call, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but given the nature of this diagnosis, which still has a huge amount of fear and stigmatization associated with it, it's best if the people giving the diagnosis are experts in the area, in the field, who can explain to the patient and answer many of their questions because I've uh, given people the diagnosis before and it is, there's quite an extraordinary amount of information out there, some of which is true and some of which is less true. And patients often have a lot of questions and it can be very difficult to answer them if you're not an expert, which I wouldn't consider myself to be. And just to re-emphasize uh, re that this does not apply to other tests. So if you get randomly uh, significant abnormalities and other results, it's still up to, uh, it's still up to us to, to chase them up. With any luck, this policy implementing opt-out testing at our a &E sites at both uh, a &E, uh, departments at both trusts, we will hopefully see an increase in our um, acquisition of HIV positive patients, including people who know they have HIV but have become lost to follow up who's a, a relatively small but quite important cohort. And if we can identify them uh, as early as possible, that significantly increases our chance of being able to get them established on ARVs before the, the immune system fails and before they have a chance to develop opportunistic infections and other complications. Uh, so thank you very much indeed to everyone for listening. Sorry to take up so much of your time. And are there any questions? That was great. Thank you very much. Any questions, anybody? I have a thought and a question uh, about consent, really, and that is that uh, we don't consent people when we do blood cultures, and we might find gonococcus. Um, do we need to really go out all this way to consent in a condition that has got such a good treatment now? 
And Dr. Matthew can correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, we, we HIV testing should now be considered in the same way as testing at a full blood count or something. Yeah, we completely must. agree. We're, we're not asking for any special, you know, consent procedure. In fact, it, it's it's going to be an opt out you know, based on a, on, on a leaflet to a patient. So there's no sort of formal discussion at all now. Yes, I'm going to say go further, have no leaflet at all and just do it. Well, what yeah. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead, James. Go ahead. Well, what I'm saying, what, what, what's the, the system at Chelsea is that every place with phlebotomy has the posters on the wall saying, if you don't want the test, you must say, I don't want the test to opt out. Given we're not doing this test routinely on wards and such like, uh, if, we, if we did it as soon as people come through the door in A&E, then people are, are very, only about 10 to 20% of people are going to have the test done mm. after that. So that should suggest that just having a poster on the wall is adequate consent. And, and all I, I, I completely agree though, Kareem. I mean, I think, I think that we are not going to get rid of stigma until we just completely normalise an HIV test. So I think, I think that is definitely the way forward. Any other, there's a few other questions. There was something about, you've answered it, about the salivary measurements. Yeah. Right, I've just seen the kind of, uh, I've just seen the uh, comment. Yeah. I think Annie's got his hand up. I was just saying, um, from our experience at Charing Cross ED, we've had more resistance from staff than from patients as in the, the preconceptions about consent. Uh, I think that, that's something that I've commonly uh, come across as well amongst sort of the junior staff, is that when you mention opt-out HIV testing, the first thought that pops up is, oh, but I, I have to have a discussion, I have to have a lengthy you know, discussion surrounding consent. There's a common misconception um, based on, on um, hearsay and some I, I think it's the word opt out, because if you say yeah. opt out, it means you can opt out. But if you even think about opting out, it doesn't become an issue. Yeah. But I think I think there's quite an ignorance still about HIV amongst staff, you know, amongst staff, as Anu says. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think when, when, whenever we've done one of our pilots, one of which is point of care testing, the main barriers to testing were staff. No, no patient refused testing. And so, and, and there's been some really interesting work done at the Royal London looking at um, staff's perspective, staff's knowledge around HIV, and it's embarrassing. It's like being back in the 80s. So, yep. you know, there's, there's a big piece of work to do around stigma, but I, I take your point. I think, I think if we just got rid of opt out altogether, that would be great. If you look at um, organ donation as a, as a parallel, countries which have opt out organ donation of rates of 80% uh, percent and above, um, Whereas opt-in countries, which is us until last year, I think, you know, the organ donation rates are horrendous. So hopefully if we take, draw the same parallels, we'll get a big, big uptick with uh, HIV testing. Thank you, team. That was really, uh, really educational and useful for us all. I've got a recording of that, so I'll uh, make that available to those who couldn't make it and say thank you all very much. And um, see you week. Could yeah. everybody fill out the feedback forms as well? If Dr. Norman, if you could just share the last slide. No, this is this is challenging us. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's, it's the same as the. Uh, is that visible now? You should share. You share your screen. Yeah, oh, share the screen and then just share the last. Oh, slide. I forget. Is that now visible? Yeah. Oh, it's a survey. Okay. Give us a second. Give us a second. We've got to get our QR code readers out, and I've got a very old phone. <laughs> there is a link as well. <laughs> I think they just leave it there for a couple of minutes, and, and yeah. it takes a little, I, I've got I've I've managed to get in actually. Perfect. So it will take give people a chance to take a picture of this. Yeah, that's fine. If we believe that then. Sasha, and I was just going to say as a last point in, in, in response to Anu's behavioural science nudge theory, I mean, yeah. we are certainly as a department very happy to give feedback about the numbers of positive cases, about the numbers that we manage to link into care. We also find that we have people who have already tested and we manage to re-engage them in yeah. care. Yeah. And by that we can and we can also do the partner notification, potentially put people on PEP or give them pre-exposure prophylaxis. So there's so many positive outcomes yeah, that we're going to be 
we can we can do lots of nudge science with you yeah All right, all 15 of you who are on this call. So can you all take a picture of this and uh, give them some feedback? I've done mine, okay? 10 okay. questions. One I'm going to stop sharing now. <laughs> okay. All right, so, well, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, sorry to take up so much of your time and uh, see you all next Friday. Yep, thanks. All right. Take care, everyone.